go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast from the shores of Lake Tahoe. I'm Ryan Nauman, the market strategist here at Zephyr. You know, we have another fantastic show lined up for us today. Uh, as you all know, we are in the midst of the greatest wealth transfer in history. Well, actually, you know, it seems like we've been going through this wealth transfer for years now, and it's going on past 10 years. We've talked about it so much. Well, this wealth transfer and a new demographic of investors has really altered the way um, wealth managers service their clients as client demands have really evolved over the past couple of years. Well, I have on the perfect guest to talk about how these changing client demands are changing the client advisor relationship. But first, today's episode is sponsored by the award-winning Zephyr which helps investment professionals make more informed investment decisions. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Leo Kelly. Leo is the CEO and partner at Verdance Capital Advisors. Leo, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's such an honor to have you on. Now, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself and Verdance Capital Advisors? Sure. Well, thank you for having me on. It's, uh, it's great to be on the show and have a conversation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so my background is, uh, um, uh, for in this business, at least, um, is, um, uh, I started at Bloomberg as an analyst, went to Merrill Lynch. We ran, a, we ran a pretty big practice at Merrill Lynch, went independent in 2012. Okay. Uh, we actually did that under the roof of Hightower. Um, and we grew the business, um, in five years, we doubled our business. And we were experiencing some success, but we decided that we wanted to go that last step uh, and go completely independent. Okay. And so we had an amicable uh, split with Hightower and started Verdant's Capital Advisors. So we left Merrill. We managed about six hundred million dollars. Um, uh, you know, within a year of leaving Hightower, because we had to get the business all rebuilt, if you will, uh, we were at about a billion two, and today we're knocking on the door of four billion. Congratulations. That's fantastic growth. So just an example of how, you know, going independent can help a practice. Is there anything just real quickly, you've gone through some three or two major transitions there in terms of, you know, your business. Right. Is there anything like you could tell advisors real quick during that transition that you learned during those two transitions? Yeah, you know, I, I, I a couple things, I think one is, um, if you're an advisor and you're sitting at a wirehouse and you have that entrepreneurial spirit, that burn, um, I, you know, when I was at Merrill, I loved Merrill. I thought I would retire there. Some of my closest friends are at Merrill. They're great advisors. Uh, but sometimes you just, um, you, you grow roots in your seat. And, you know, I, I, I used to, you know, I used to say being at Merrill at the end was kind of like I was, I, I was sleeping with my eyes open during work. And, yeah. It's not that we were lazy. We were doing a good job for clients, but we were missing that big picture that 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 what it means to own a business and build and grow and be creative and and doing it for the client. We have a saying around here, and, and this is really what I think advisors should think about. Our saying here is build a business if the, as if the client was the architect, okay. right? And if you always keep that in front of you, then you're going to have a good business. You're going to grow. Well, we couldn't do that at the wirehouse, right? We're restricted to the rules around us. So the first thing I would say in my two transitions, one, if you're thinking about it, go do the work, go do the due diligence. It's easier than you think. The actual transition is always hard, but the reality is the um, advancement of technology and size and platform in the IRA space is amazing. And the bigger your team, the, the better it is. So I, I would say that's probably one of my big takeaways. Yeah, I always say this, uh, every Friday, uh, when you look on wealthmanager.com and some others, right, what do you see? You see big wirehouse team leaves and goes independent, right? When's the last time you saw big independent goes to wirehouse? It never happens. There's a reason for that. 
I, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's really an interesting shift when, you know, when I was in the industry um, as a portfolio manager for an R of financial advisors, we often talked about it. But back then, during the early, you know, twenty some years ago, it was the technology just wasn't there to go independent. And now, like you said, it's a lot easier than what you think. Hey, you know, like I shouldn't, I should caveat that the transition's hard. Yeah. But um, the infrastructure is now there um, to make it easier. And, and I would say there's two, two other key elements to that. One is the transition is as hard as you make it, right? If you prepare, if you, if you make a move to line your pocket, clients will sense that and it'll be hard. Mm -hmm. If you make a move in the client's best interest, and, and you and you have that conversation with a client, the transition is much easier. I think the other big thing, if there's one takeaway from my experience, building this business, culture is everything. Have great partners, have people with the same vision, the same moral fiber, the same belief system that you have, and you'll come to work and you'll love work every day, right? I have, I just have great partners that have supported this and we've got great folks working we're, we're, we're hyper collaborative it's a fun place to be that's such a great point to about kind of transition from that topic to and you talked about it clients right clients can yeah. sense that if it's about the money or really about their best interests you know and we often talk about clients are demanding you know a more personalized approach and i think they can sense that you know the service that you're offering from financial advisors so, you know, how are client demands changing that relationship between clients and advisors? Um, I'll I tell you a, a quick short story to set this up. When, when Schwab and Fidelity first announced zero commissions, right? Yep. Uh, we were at a partner retreat about a week later. And uh, one of my partners said, you know, are, are we at risk? Is the whole industry going to zero, right? Are we going to see massive fee compression? And... Um, obviously I didn't believe that, but fast forward to today and fees have not compressed, right? When we talk to the folks that see, uh, like, like if you talk to the CEO at Orion who sees billing for most of the industry, he'll tell you that fees aren't compressing, but what is compressing is margins okay. because what you, so, so the industry is not fee compressing, it's margin compressing. What does that mean? The client wants more service. And interestingly, as the whole world goes more technological, AI, right, and, and technology-based, what we find is our high net worth, ultra high net worth, family office clients want an even more personal connection, right? So, so they want more services. And that's why, you know, essentially, the company that we built is a platform company. We're building out platforms of services that advisors can draw from all these platforms to give the client a very broad experience. You know, if you're a small RIA or your wirehouse and you have a portfolio that you run, you're going to get commoditized out of the business. Yeah. Right. You you have to be a relationship manager. You have to have close ties to the client. You have to offer a lot of extend, extra services. Yep. Fantastic. And going back to when I started, it was, you know, a lot about the investment management. That's what you sold, right? Is all oh, I could, you know, got this performance and building portfolios and picking the best mutual funds or ETFs or investments. Well, that really doesn't resonate today, right? It's not about getting the best returns. It's about that client relationship, achieving goals, objectives, much more goals based and, and really focusing on that relationship. Yeah. You know, one thing that you mentioned is about technology and AI. Um, that's one thing, you know, advisors probably think about first when they're trying to address these demands and, and enhance a client advisor relationship is through technology, just like you mentioned, um, to make the practice more efficient so they can spend more time nurturing that relationship. You know, how can technology and, and AI help with this evolution of the, that client advisor relationship? Yeah, I, there, I think AI is this, um, you know, it's this, it's this wonderful opportunity in our business that some folks are frightened to death over. And um, if, if used incorrectly or ignored, I think you should be afraid of it. Yeah. Um, but if embraced, I think this could be a very powerful tool, as was, you know, 
email, the internet, video <laughs> conferencing, right? So we've gone through these processes of change that were going to forever change the business, and they have. Um, in our view, and we're going through a technology rebuild, and we want to use AI and drive outcomes. Um, but what I would say is this. You have to go through the steps, right? If you just say, I want AI and just go throw it into the mix, um, you're going to have scattered shot outcomes. And you have to plan for it just like you plan for uh, business growth. So from our perspective, the first thing we're doing is we're getting we're managing our data better. Before you start running off and use applications, we're getting control of our data. We're doing a, a, a redo and a restack of our technology that's grabbing our data and organizing our data. Because once we have good control over our data, then we can start to use applications. And so um, when we think about AI, up to this point, it's all been infrastructure built, right? What's next is application. So from our perspective, we're gonna, we're gonna own the data and then we're gonna look at the AI and we're, we're gonna look at it and say, okay, how can we improve process, which saves time? And then B, how can we improve client experience? Okay, now here's where it gets dangerous. If you make AI a, a call center, clients are gonna hate it, right? If you're not personal, if you're letting AI write everything to the client and they sense it's not you, that's not necessarily good. But if you're letting AI help you write, help you do different things, so you can spend more time with the clients, that's a home run. That's an absolute home run. If you can make your, your, your people more productive at what they do every day, that's a home run. So I, I, I think AI could be extraordinarily powerful. You just have to plan carefully and step deliberately with it. But we're excited about where we're going with it. Yeah, Leo, that's such fantastic advice there. You don't want to do AI just for the sake of AI so you can put it on your marketing website or whatever saying that you have AI. There has to be a purpose behind it. And, you know, it's data driven. Your data has got to be clean. Your data, you got to be able to harness all that data that you have, which which can be a big task. And you guys probably know that right now. Um, yeah, and I'd add, one, I'd, I'd add one other thing. If you save all this time, just so that you can go to the golf course more, you know, or, or hang out at home more, um, that too will get sensed by the client, right? The key is, what are you going to do with the time you save? Make it about the client and you'll be successful with it. You you bring up such a good point. And one thing I I'm not much of a technology person. You know, I deal more with investments and AI. I completely agree with that. You got to um, you know leverage it somehow. It can really help your practice. We're looking at how to leverage it here at Zephyr, but you can't lose that personalized touch. We talk a lot about it. It's all about the personalization, and you made such a good point that if the client senses you're using AI to do all the communication, you've completely lost that personalized touch. You've lost connection with them and you'll lose, lose that relationship. Such a great point there that leverage AI, but you can't, um, you know, lose the personalization. Yeah, exactly. You know, what do you think you brought up email and in our initial conversations too, you kind of talked about where it trained, you know, what happened there with email years ago, but what do you think the end game looks like for our eyes to incorporate AI? I, you know, it could be completely different than what we're thinking about today. Right. Yeah. Well, I think uh, every step of the process, right. When the new disruptive technology comes out, you think, um, uh, you know, how, how's this going to be? You know, one of the first instincts is this going to replace me. Yeah. And as I go back to the internet <laughs> and I remember, um, when that first came out, right. It was email and then some illicit sites that were used. Right? That was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what was going on on the internet. There was no productivity. Yeah. So infrastructure was being built rapidly, but there really wasn't a good usage of it other than email. And, you look at it today and, you know, I mean, we wouldn't even use email if the SEC didn't demand, right? So, yeah. um, so as we, as we take a step back, um, what happened with the internet? And the internet became everything everybody ever said it was going to, and it helped all of us research better. It helped us communicate better. It helped us be more creative. It established better marketing ideas and principles. I mean, everything that it was 
hope to be became, you know, became. But but that was once the applications of the internet were built, which happened years later. I think AI is at that same point, right? We're building it. There's some early applications, which, you know, for example, we use AI to listen in on our calls and leave uh, notes. That's great. That's great technology. Our marketing folks are using AI. Um, if we were doing our podcast, I have a podcast from the ground up when we do it. We use AI to you know, listen to it and help us edit, et cetera. Those are all great things. But the powerful AI applications are coming, right? And so if we think back to 1999, 2000, the big players, Cisco, JDS Uniface, they're not around anymore. Yeah, Netscape, not around anymore. They were the, the absolute winners. Instead, we have Google, right? Microsoft is around. They did, they did come through this thing. Apple became a whole different company. Yeah. I think we're going to see the same thing. I think the, the folks that are going to be dominant in, in AI may not even be here yet, right? They're, they're small startups that are developing applications. So I, I, I think it's still a big question mark. I, I don't think when you go into AI... I think the key is not to go in with a final drawing of the home, but understand what you want from it, right? Again, client's the architect. So try to understand what we want to do. Here's what I want to do. I want to make my people more productive. I want to make the mundane tasks that they do every day that take up a tremendous amount of time go away. So for example, my assistants who are scared that AI hey, can just replace all their activity. Well, what if it does? That's good. Then they could start doing outreach to clients. They can be proactive with services, right? That enhances the client relationship. So I think you have to start with what's your primary goal of your business? And then how can I enhance that service by, by freeing up time? And that will drive the actual implementation of AI. That's the way I look at it, if that answered your question. No, that's fantastic. And not to go off on a tangent, but back in the day you talk about email and i think probably one of the best things that email did was they got rid of the inner office mail right you know <laughs> i started at piper jaffrey in minneapolis and we, it was we had those envelopes all over the place you know that's how we communicated right. with the advisors and other branches was the inner office mail is like oh my god chaos well 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 guys guys um with with snow on the roof like i have <laughs> or no we'll, hair yeah or we'll remember the sound Thump. yes right? had the <laughs> when you had the tubes the, the, the suction tubes and you put put a trade in a tube and stick it in and go flying through the ceiling i mean it's crazy right yeah and, and, i i remember yeah. those days in seattle yeah the it was always reminding me of going to the bank with my dad and you know the driving and right uh, right uh crazy times so yeah now technology is you know eliminated us and everything's more efficient now it's right. makes everything so much more efficient you started at merrill at a big wire house. Now you're independent. Um, do you think RIs have a leg up on wire houses or the large broker dealers when it comes to implementing AI and this evolution and being able to harness the, the benefits of it? I, I don't think there's any question that's the case, right? That's, I think, part of this whole thing of uh, when we talked about the, the headlines going one way, not the other, yeah. and why you know, when I was in the business, RIAs were growing, but the wirehouses were dominant in terms of assets under management, and that's flipped. Um, and part of that, again, is that technology revolution. It changed everything because in the past, RIAs were mom and pop shops, right? And they were, you know, doing a portfolio that they ran or some annuities or whatever the case was. And you you had to be at a wirehouse if you had a large, sophisticated business. And then after 2000 through call it 05, when the technology revolution just burst into fintech, right? The original fintech. Yep. Suddenly, RIAs, large RIAs could actually run sophisticated businesses. Well, fast forward to today, and RIAs have gotten big. The industry's gotten huge. Not just the industry in terms of the size of RIAs, which are significantly larger, yep. but the support the support mechanism around RIAs. So the vendors have gotten big and sophisticated. 
You have RAs like us. We have a business called RIA Plus, Burdens RIA Plus, mm -hmm. which is a, a service provider to smaller RIAs so they can access our, our complete service model, and then they can be as big as we are, right, just by, by hiring us to do all that back office. So the industry is so much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I think the big issue is, right, so in the past, it was not big enough versus rule-based. Now it's definitely big enough, but the rule base hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the wirehouses, so you know, when I was at the wirehouse, I remember being frustrated one time at some crazy management decisions. And I, I talked to my mentor and he said to me, Leo, you're making a mistake. I'll never forget this. He said, you're making a mistake. He said, you can't get upset with them for making management decisions based on your business because they're not managing to your business. They're managing to the lowest common denominator. They're managing to the highest risk business in their in their platform. And when you have this huge business and you have to manage all risk, then the folks that are doing it right are following a, a restrictive set of rules. And so what I always remember in the wirehouse is they had great technology, but by the time they came out with it, it took so long to build proprietary wrappers that it, it already was advancing past what they were introducing. So I, I, I think they're going to struggle. And I think it's going to struggle for one run reason, one reason only. I think they'll come out with cool tools and, and they'll advertise the hell out of them and, and, and say, look how sophisticated we are. But the reality is they always see risk first, not client first. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they'll never completely open that up, right? Because they'll always be trying to manage it. That's a fantastic way, Leo, to kind of, put a wrapper on this conversation. It was really fun conversation. Speaking of fun, I always like to you try and end the conversation with something fun, uh, maybe a fun story. It could be business related, not uh, football season starting. I don't know. Um, you know, any any interesting story. It could be business related, um, market related, any interesting thing you've seen lately or read about. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, well, it's not too fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I read, I, I just finished a book. It was pretty fascinating, actually. It's, uh, it's a book called The Fourth Turning is Here. And um, it's long, and it's a long read. But if anybody's out there saying, what the hell is it with millennials and Gen Zs? This is a, this is a, a, a great book because it speaks, about, it speaks about us as human beings and how we react to events. And, and it is our reaction that creates repetitive cycles. And I think what's fascinating about it, it talks about four turns and what they, you know, in a light, a span of a, of a normal life, right? And they, so there's these 80 to 100 year events and there's four moments inside of that. And what I found fascinating about the book, unfortunately for everybody, it says we're in the fourth, which is a crisis stage, which started in 09. And unfortunately, it usually ends in a war, um, which is scary, but what I liked is on the other side of any event like this, it starts over again. Yeah. And we as human beings are so predictable and repeatable and, and predictive that um, you see remarkable consistency. So no, the millennials, they're good kids. They're hard workers. They're accomplishing things. Gen Z's great. They're gonna continue to be great. We're overzealous parents and it's happened for thousands of years, I thought it was a great book. It's again, I don't know if that's fun, um, but it was an interesting book that I would recommend. No, it is. You know, I'm, you know, reading, rereading reminiscence of a stock operator that every financial investment professional has read. I'm rereading that again. I love that book. It's always good yeah. to get new book recommendations. And it's fun that you bring up millennials and, and the gen. Z, wherever we're talking about them now, um, labeling them as, because there's like that negative connotation of them, but they are really driving some great things in this industry, such as technology and, you know, efficiencies and, um, yeah, it's good. It's fascinating. The book, the book talks about the fact, and it's so true, right? That the boomers, so you have your GI generation who fights the war and they're these incredible people and they're all about national unity and they build great yep. things like we did in the fifties. And then the boomers are like the, the, you know, the enlightened people who, who want to, you know, bring us back and change everything. And, 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 and they get all completely centered. 
And then Gen Z, Gen X, which is us, you know, we're the latchkey kids that grew up on our own. And so are these pr pragmatic people who are like, to hell with everybody. We'll just do it ourselves. And, and again, these are all repeatable. And what, you know, the millennials and the, and the Gen Zs and who's coming next, you know, they're loyal people mm -hmm. and they're learners and they're workers. Now, they don't have the same characteristics as the boomers. They don't have that, um, you know, uh, greed is good mentality that, that from Wall Street that, you know, Gen, Gen, uh, Gen X has. Um, but every generation thinks that the young kids below them are idiots. Yeah. And it's just not true, right? That GIs thought boomers were idiots because they were so flaky then. It turns out they're they're thoughtful. You know, they thought our generation just didn't give a shit. That we were just <laughs> pragmatic. And so now you go to this generation and we think they're flaky, but they're creative. And so I, 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 I'm excited about it. I think they're coming into their own now. They're figuring it out. Give them a chance. Um, but I do, I will say this. Uh, I'll end this for the fun part. <laughs> I, I I give, I, you know, I do a, I guess a talk. So a lot of kids come to me and just say, Hey, can I come meet with you? What you think I'm starting my career? My son was a college football player. So his teammates come to me or kids we know from, you know, contacts, et cetera. And I have this talk all the time and I tell them, and I, and I stole it from uh, the word I stole from from uh, from a Navy SEAL. But I said, be a savage. There are no more savages in the world, right? And being a savage isn't being mean, yeah, right? Being a savage isn't being ruthless. What it means is you just put your head down and you work as hard as you can and you, you drive to an outcome and you don't worry. You don't worry about how fast am I getting promoted or what am I getting paid or what's the person next yeah. to me getting paid? Right. The people who are really grinders, they don't they don't look around and see where they are. and They just run. Right. They just run the race. And I mean, for that generation, so many are trying to stay in line with everyone else. I, just go ahead and start running. And, and I think that generation is starting to figure this out. Um, I, I do think COVID and the work at home policies, which I think are awful. Um, stunted their growth, but I think we're coming out of that now. Yeah, I I love that, Leo. Such a fantastic way. I love the. I might have to t title this uh, episode "Be Savage." <laughs> I love it, um, Leo. You mentioned your podcast. I've watched yes. it in um, great podcasts. I love it. Right. You guys have such a lot of great resources. Um, I mentioned I focus more on the investments, but I watch Megan, your CIO's podcast. Yes. I think it's Markets uh, with Megan. Markets with Megan, yeah. Yep, yeah, fantastic. As a one person research person uh, group, I watch that a lot. But um, great resources. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can our listeners learn more about Verdant's Capital Advisors? Well, you can always go to the website, uh, www.verdence.com. -E -E um, our podcasts are on there. So Megan does, as you said, Markets with Megan, which is a market update every day. I do From the Ground Up once a month where we talk with entrepreneurs and business owners about their journey and their challenges and how they built what they did. And then Matt Andrelot, uh, once a quarter, does the alternative view which is deep dives with private alternative managers and, and their disciplines. So we've got a couple different options. We have a lot of content to read. Um, and so, um, and our team's there, which I am immensely proud of. So happy to have folks come on and, and subscribe to our podcasts. Fantastic. Leo, thank you again. It was really a fun conversation. I really enjoy it. I think our listeners are going to really take a lot from it too. It was an honor to have you on. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Zephyr's Adjusted for Risk podcast. You can watch all of our other podcasts on the Zephyr YouTube channel, as well as on Spotify and iHeartRadio. Thank you, and have a great rest of your week.